showcase two dramatically different perspectives. We have the view from above or the top down perspective. And then when you open it, we have the view from below or the grassroots perspective. And as you can tell, um, this top down perspective is drawn in the style of an old world map as an allusion to colonization. Um, and the idea is that, you know, from so high above, all you can see of this landmass that is Mesoamerica are the large infrastructure projects planned for the region. Dams, pipelines, mega highways, factory zones, airports, and it's resistance to these projects. That's the theme of the overall piece. Now, um, one aspect of this old world map I could zoom in on, I did a little bit for you last night, was the uh, oh compass roads with the wow. representatives of the banana and coffee industries, oh, yeah. uh, two export crops that have had an outsized influence over the region. You know, they used to call countries like Honduras or uh, Costa Rica banana republics because of the influence of this industry. And in fact, Chiquita Bananas, of course, is the rebranded United Fruit Company who was responsible for the 1954 coup against Tacubo Arbenz in Guatemala. That coup paved the way for a U.S. supported military dictatorship, followed by a civil war, which was later branded a genocide because of how much it targeted uh, the Mayan people. Mm. And so oh, they're, wow. you know, kind of presiding over this roulette table, gambling with the future of Mesoamerica. And the names that are on it are logos of companies? The Chica Banana and Com Starbucks. Yeah, com yes, th these are the two uh, figures. Yeah. And then these are kind of more like, you know, uh, some of them are companies like Ford, and we have the IFC, which is the International Financial Corporation, uh, which is kind of like the private wing of the World Bank Group. This map also serves as an economic snapshot of the region. So all these boats represent various industries, imports and exports, both historic and contemporary. And so here, for example, we have fast food with deforestation in its toe from all the um, deforestation for livestock raising. You know, the ship with the Canadian flag on it is representing mining. Uh, we have uh, cocaine with money laundering in its toe. Uh, a historic reference to sugar, slaves, and gold with modern accents of the banking industries and uh, um, the prison industrial complex. And this represents the triangular trade route that drove the colonization of the Americas, where the same boats would be taking, you know, the sugar for the rum and the uh, people and the gold. Um, so all of these industry ships are being blown around or in some cases sucked up by these trade winds. Get it? So these are storms in the cardinal directions representing an economic pressure system acting on the region. So from the north, we have the storm cloud of militarization, pesticides, culture, technology, and emissions. Where in the south, the hurricane is brewing. Unnatural disaster caused by climate change, war, economic and industrial displacement causing a wave of migration north. From Asia, the manufacturing cloud, bringing in parts to be assembled in the factory zones of Mesoamerica to be sucked up by the consumer tornado to bring to markets in North America and Europe. So we do this to kind of highlight the fact that Mesoamerica is kind of located within the confluence of these external economic forces that are determining the development in the region rather than the local people setting their own path. You know, like their, their um, development is so determined by these external economic forces. The global institutions that are responsible for enabling this kind of top-down development. So here we have the World Trade Organization. Whoa! The Sorry. faceless judge. Um, with one hand, you can see the riot cop hand puppet is playing Papa Mole with the various resistance movements. Oh, wh who is the judges? Yeah, the judge. The faceless judge. You said yeah, it's, a, it's an allusion to the tribunals that the government uh, that the WTO would hold to determine whether a country's laws, you know, be they labor laws or environmental mm -hmm. laws, are trade barriers and should thus be eliminated. So um, mm -hmm. this was one of the first organizations Jeffy. following the like international labor organization to Jeffy. really regulate world Jeffy. trade. Which hey. I um, hey, I'm talking lost to you, happening. Kathy. Uh, this is spectacular. Kathy. The legal fiction is empty of hey. substance. I'm talking to you. So it would make sense to be faceless. This is spectacular. Mm -hmm. I'm just blown away every time, Saku. <laughs> and so uh, the riot cop is playing Papa Mole with the various resistance movements, where each mole represents a community that's mobilized in mass against the WTO ministerial. Oh, and the turtle up front. Is so that for like the environmentalists? 
the turtle is the environmentalist, and then what about like the thirteen um, tribes within the turtle's back of Turtle Island? Is that connected in also? No, 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 no. Well, here, at least here, it's it's just me and the environmentalist, and like, because uh, like Greenpeace actually dressed up as like green turtles during the WTO um, protest in 1999 in Seattle. Oh. This was kind of like the big moment of the anti-globalization like era, <laughs> where they shut down. Um, this ministerial meeting that was supposed to happen uh. Uh, by blocking, basically shutting down the cities and blocking all the roads going into this conference center. Like what they did with the um, tractors for the G20 or G8 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, similar mobilizations would happen around those sorts of global meetings as well. Wow. Um, like more, you know, in the aughts, early aughts. <laughs> so um, the green turtle representing environmentalists, uh, the Zapatista bull representing um, like Southern Mexico, Mexican indigenous people and farmers. We have the Bandana Shiva moles represent Indian farmers and the uh, uh, South Korean moles represent uh, Korean farmers. And then at the end we have the hard-hatted mole to represent uh, organized labor because of course it was the WTO's policies that first took good manufacturing jobs at home and drove them overseas into sweatshops. Mm -hmm. Who did? What? Who did? The WTO's policies. The WTO's policies. When was the WTO formed? I am not sure exactly when it was formed. I would guess around like the 90s, but and maybe that's just when it grew to prominence. Okay. Um, we have the judge's robe crumbling, if you can see. Yeah, it is. Um, and that's because, um, you know, the WTO with its, you know, 160 member countries um, has become less relevant in recent years. And that's largely because the poor countries within that structure were able to organize and actually get some gains, mm -hmm. some things that the powerful countries did not want to let go of. And in fact, they didn't because they would always put this like small print. Like, you know, for example, the Doha rounds of negotiations mm -hmm. was supposed to mean that any country could, could um, manufacture generic drugs if there was a public health emergency. Mm -hmm. But then when we saw with COVID was mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it seemed like we had to ask permission from the states still mm -hmm. to allow it to happen. And it's like, that's not very democratic at all. Like this was supposed to be, you know, like I, you know, who am I to say that this WTO policy should be respected, but this was negotiated in this Doha, India. Democratic, isn't it? Yeah, so, you know, anyway, so like uh, the ro robe is crumbling because the dirty work of the WTO uh, since, you know, the early 2000s has been taken over by these bilateral and trilateral uh, trade agreements, free trade zones like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, wow. and these um, investor protection agreements, uh, which is basically what they are. The tribunals are now run by the World Bank, and the biggest like absurdity of them is that corporations can sue entire countries, mm -hmm. not only for lost investment, mm -hmm. but for lost potential profit. Wow. Yeah. And so, for example, um, there was cost. a recent ruling in Pakistan where Pakistan had to give Barrick Gold, which is a Canadian mining company, six billion dollars mm -hmm. for refusing them a mining permit, mm -hmm. even though Barrick had only invested a little over a hundred million into the project. Oh. You know, and of course, this is just used because they didn't want Barrick to mine there, and of course, this was just used as a sort of coercive measure to force Pakistan back to the table to allow Barrick to buy the gold. Large bank um, that is funded by largely ex-colonial powers, hence the Conquistador <laughs> cash register, uh, because Spain was the biggest financier of this development project. And um, what we always like to show people is these paper cutout people that are having a show put on for them by this jack-in-the-box PR guy, showing them PPP, Plan Puebla Panama, with a rainbow and a pot of gold at the end promising that these development projects are going to translate into riches for the local community. But you can see the paper cutout people are actually being lined up to be shaken down by those finger puppet politicians. And out of their pockets is falling the money where the coins are turning into pipelines and the dollar bills are turning into mega highways mm -hmm. to illustrate that it's the public that ultimately pays for this infrastructure that amounts to a subsidy for big business. Yeah. You know, and, it, and locally, like to combine like the two of them, you know, um, when we look at like uh, the government of Canada deciding to buy pipelines, you know, a lot of that was because, you know, the indigenous resistance and uh, other delays that it was facing um, could have uh, triggered a multi-billion dollar lawsuit, right? 
um, from the Chinese financiers and other financiers. And so, like, there's these uh, global pressures that are also, you know, signed up for by our politicians, um, but that, like, basically um, make it so that, you know, the government can say, oh, our hands are tied. We have to, you know, go down this path of development that people think is the wrong way for us to be mm -hmm. <laughs> developing at this day and age as we're on the precipice of uh, so many environmental calamities and just trying to do our, you know, people on the ground trying to do our best to mm -hmm. avoid them. Mm -hmm. um, down here we have the World Bank um, as the gambler Volk. You know, with one arm you can see he's gambling with the climate with the projects he's investing in. Uh, the other hand is stamping out coins from the exhaust of this oil refinery chess piece um, to signify the World Bank's role in the creation of carbon markets, which is a very unregulated market um, of carbon credits, you know, where you can like buy and sell the ability to pollute and, and because it's unregulated, you know, certain things that you get carbon credits for are like burning trash and <laughs> like all of this kind of ridiculous thing. Uh, but not all carbon credits are created equally. No. Um, you know, planting tree plantations, you know, of all the same, you know, trees, which of course makes pe things more vulnerable um, to things like pests and, you know, massive issues when you have forests that are 100% uniform. Um, I always like to sh show people the gambler's table, where next to different silhouettes of countries and continents, we have these stacks of chips. And uh, the countries and continents with the smallest stacks of chips, well, they have bear traps over them, right? And so that's to signify that the World Bank's loans are a trap. Ah, yes. Because the World Bank will loan maybe Guatemala $60 million so yeah. they can build a big road. You know, or Honduras, you know, even more to build a dam. And mm. once the country gets highly indebted to these in, in international institutions, they actually spend a large part of their annual revenue just servicing this debt. And so um, it leaves them vulnerable to something called structural adjustment when the country becomes desperate for like this influx of cash. And do you guys know what structural adjustment policies are? Have you ever heard of Tell that us, before? Please. Um, sometimes it's also just called conditionality is like a new term that they've been throwing mm -hmm. around for the same thing. Um, but the World Bank has their own SAPs. Uh, but the biggest culprit of structural adjustment is illustrated here is the faceless surgeon mm -hmm. performing reconstructive surgery. Oh my on God. So a structural adjustment program wow. is basically a loan with strings attached. Yeah. And not the traditional strings of the World Bank's loans, which generally had it so that the country that put the most towards the loan would have their contractors picked to do the uh, construction of the you know, dam or whatever, you know, in one pocket, out one pocket into the next. But the strings attached I'm talking about is in order to accept a structural adjustment loan, you have to actually reshape your economy. Yeah. And uh, it's to their liking. So you have to privatize public resources, like you have to privatize your oil industry and then we'll give you this gigantic loan of money and flux of cash. You have to privatize your uh, water distribution. So uh, public services, right, that were offered to everybody um, as like a right. Um, as a privilege or to, benefit. Yeah, you have to stop um, making education so cheap. You can't give free education to rural school teachers anymore. You gotta get them to pay for it, in right? Um, which, of course, like the privatization of education generally at the higher levels is making it so um, a certain class of people maintains in control and all other classes of people become so indebted to these college you know, debts um, that they become changed to the system as well and can't change it. Now, the IMF, um, will say you have to offer your goods at a cheaper rate on the global market. And so here we can see um, that it's extracting resources with a three-pronged syringe, applying leeches, um, keeping Mesoamerica on this IV of development. So we have this cement truck leading into an IV. So because clever. the IMF is never going to question oh the God. actual reason at why these countries got into debt in the first place, which is actually often loans to dictators. <laughs> but, um, you know... Also, the construction of this large infrastructure, the suture, uh, like the stitches being sewn with this pen, like these these agreements yes, to yes. adjust the economy, um, and the knot in the stethoscope to show that the IMF is not listening to the hearts of the people they're impacting oh on the ground. Oh my God, you gave me shivers. Now, the last kind of analytical piece, and I don't go over all of this, and I'm not going to go over all this entire 
graphic. This book took nine years to create, and I could honestly talk about it for five hours straight. You absolutely which is could. Wow. Not a good YouTube video, and <laughs> you know, not really appropriate for this piece either. <laughs> you will be as this. And so these are uh, the kind of figurines on the edges of this graphic. Each one a vicious cycle or strategy uh -huh. of displacement. You know, so for example, here we're talking about violence against people. You know, scorched earth policies that were used in the dirty wars in Guatemala, um, their civil war. And then here we have violence against the land. And we're particularly highlighting the false promise or Trojan horse, if you will, yes. of biofuels, right? Yes. And so here we have this uh, Trojan horse with the uh, logos of the energy and in, um, agriculture companies. And coming out of the chute are these corn that are turning into these corn quispadors. And they're showing us what's wrong with these uh, oh. biofuels. And so uh, talking corn about GMO quispador. corn and this um, aspect, but there's many other biofuels. Wow. Um, so this one has a syringe to represent genetic contamination. This one has a um, chainsaw to represent deforestation. Wow. And then this one has a gas pump that's held up to the head of this ant that's grinding corn for tortillas. Oh, Lord. And this is meant to represent this new dynamic of food versus fuel. Because now arable land that could be used locally to provide sustenance for the local community um, is yeah. instead mm -hmm. being used to grow biofuels for to you know uh, service the insatiable energy needs of the global north, right? Which is an injustice. You know, you think about like gentrification, but you know, you don't even have like the local yuppies that are benefiting from it, like the actual people benefiting are like don't even live in your country, oh right? My God. You're familiar with O Economicus? No. No. So that's connected to manorialism and seignorialism, which is the manor system of the top down hierarchical like leadership. Feudal? It's the feudal system, but the manorial system was before when the Roman Republic had not yet split between the Church of the East and the West of the Court. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not super aware of that history, though I do know some, I do need to know some Roman history. Study Latin. Good for you. <laughs> Last piece is these Mobius strips, and I think I actually already went over this one with you. Yeah. Would, you, do you want me to do it again, or Paul no? hasn't heard it, and V. I haven't heard it. Okay, so you want to hear more? Do you want to hear about more of these Mobius sure. strips, or do you want to move to the inside where the more inspiring stories are? <laughs> this is a more systemic analysis here. Anyways, um, so I love to go over this top one because, you know, when we talk about like the first stage of capitalism, that is the privatization of the commons, right? Uh, things that are held commonly, like land, um, being divided up, and it's just a matter of time when you introduce debt that these resources become consolidated into the hands of a few. And so here's one similar dynamic, and we have the beehive here to represent the collectively held land. In Mexico, they were called ejidos, and it was a result of the Mexican Revolution, you know, whose tagline was land and liberty, tierra y libertad, right? And um, once the revolution was successful, they passed the Ejido Act, which gave plots of land to um, communities and the idea was that no matter what happened to the economy, no one would ever starve because they would always have land to grow food on. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. seems like a minimal thing that people should have the right to, right? <laughs> um, and so when NAFTA passed, the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, it forced a change to the Constitution of Mexico to allow for a subdivision of the ejidos. Mm. And so here we have NAFTA oh. passing and Farmer B gets a deed, their very own hexagon of land from the Agriculture Department. And with that deed can now get a loan from the bank. There they are proudly farming their own hexagon of land, but the fruits of their labor can't compete with the subsidized imports coming in from the US. So this truck with an American flag on it is doing what we call grain dumping, or selling grain, in this case, uh, GMO corn, at below market value because the farmers that grew it received free money from the government in the form of subsidies. Mm. Well, farmer bee can't compete with corn that's sold below cost, so they have to break their piggy bank sell their land and are forced into migration where they either end up migrating to a city and working in a sweatshop or migrating north to work on other people's farms in the US and Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And all these wealthy countries, you know, Australia, New Zealand, US, Canada, they have these migrant worker programs, right? And basically what it does is it brings people up for economic opportunity like, um, that are searching for that, that need, that are desperate for that economic opportunity, uh, gives them 
fairly low wages considering the, the hard work that they're doing, but doesn't allow them to stay, doesn't allow them to bring their families. And so it gets them for the most productive years of their life, mm -hmm. where their retirement and education is mm -hmm. subsidized by their home country, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I would say, good enough to work, good enough to stay. You know, it's, it's fine that they, you know, come up here to work and have opportunity, but they should be able to stay and live here if they choose to. A lot of people would still want to go back to their mm -hmm. families. And when you open up the graphic, you get a completely different perspective. Rather than the outsider's view of the colonial map, this one is drawn from the perspective of one of the animals and the root structures. And they're all looking up at this giant ceiba tree, which is the tree of life in Guatemala and sacred in all Mesoamerican cultures. And spiraling around the ceiba tree like DNA strands are the streams of winged and water creatures. These are the spirit animals. They're scientifically illustrated to be animals that are either endemic endangered or extinct from the region, representing the presence of ancestors. Because we started this entire piece with a six month tour of Mesoamerica. And one of the things that the communities told us again and again, independently of one another, was that if we were going to illustrate their stories, we had to have the ancestors presenting. Not only because you know of the presence of ancestors within Mesoamerican cultures, uh, but also because the people we spoke to identified as being in the same struggle as their grandparents and their grandparents before them. Wow. You know, they've been fighting these systems way longer than we have because it came as colonization. Um, and so also spiraling around the ceiba tree are these ants. And there's over 70 different species of ants and over 400 different species of um, animals illustrated on the inside of this graphic. So uh, this, is, this um, poster was out of print. Um, last year and we finally reprinted it and when we did uh, we added the species map oh my God. Um, which shows all 400 uh, different animal species that we chose to illustrate I mean there's many many more <laughs> species of animals um, there um, you know many of which we uh, specifically chose uh, because when we would go to these communities we'd often ask them um, so, we'd show them our past work. This is the third piece in a trilogy uh, on the Americas. And you show us them our past work and ask them, what animal would you like to represent you? You know, and so... You asked all of the communities that are present in here, in your tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's spectacular. Which is a great way of learning about um, how people relate cool. to their local ecology, yeah. right? Yeah. Through the animals and especially when you're talking about uh, struggles for the defense of the land. We feel like the stories of the people does reflect the stories of the animals, or the stories of the animals reflect the story of the people.